man just uh, made reference to the to Marvel. Now I want to say Avengers Assemble. <laughs> So I wanted to start our time this morning thinking about Christ-centered preaching by thinking about Christ, right, and trying to root some of the assumptions, at least for me, that drive me to try and practice Christ-centered preaching, try to root those assumptions in, in the Lord himself uh, and, and what, he's, what the Lord appears to be doing with the Scripture. Uh, sometimes I think we, we have a lot of good thinking on preaching, and it's great, um, but it necessarily rooted uh, in the Scripture always. And um, I want to be careful not to just give you my opinions, but uh, in that first talk to try and sort of say, here's what the Lord did with the Word, and we can't do better with the Word than what Jesus does with it, right? Well, with that, then, uh, what I was arguing is that if we, if we re read our Bibles the way Jesus read his Bible, then the, the natural result ought to be something resembling what we call Christ-centered preaching. And my brother uh, in the back, he, he pulled my, he pulled my, short t my shirt tail back there and said, hey, what's Christ-centered preaching? And uh, that's what I want to come to now. So when we sort of add the adjective Christ-centered to preaching, what, what do we mean? Do we mean anything distinct from just preaching? Well, I think we have to. Um, because there's preaching of all sorts. Muslim imams preach. Jewish rabbis preach. Right? Everybody with a cause will preach in some fashion. So Christ-centered preaching has to be distinguished from other types of preaching it even has to be distinguished from other kinds of Christian preaching, right? Uh, preaching that goes on in the church that maybe doesn't quite hit the bar of focusing on Jesus. So what do we mean by Christ-centered preaching? So if you allow me in this, in this lecture, I really want to pull from the thinking of other faithful um, Christian men who have thought a lot about preaching and theology and uh, use a lot of their work in this lecture. So what do we mean by Christ-centered preaching? I want, we can define this several ways, but I want to use two quotes here um, to, to help us define this or think about this. The first was from uh, D.A. Carson in his book, The Cross in Christian Ministry. Fantastic book. I uh, highly commend it. He writes this, and I'll, I'll repeat it a couple times for those of you who are taking notes and want to try to get it down. Done properly... Preaching is simply the representation of God's gospel, God's good news, by which men and women come to know him. Thus, preaching mediates God himself. I'll give it to you again. Done properly, preaching is simply the representation of God's gospel, God's good news, by which men and women come to know him, thus preaching mediates God himself. The, the second quote comes from, everybody get that? Who wanted to get that? One more time, sure, no problem, no problem. Done properly, comma, <laughs> I used it, I don't know how many of you all used a little voice text thing on your phone. And so I've got to the point now where, you know, you have to say comma and period, all this stuff. I've got to the point where I'm in regular sentences. I'd be like, I'm, in a minute, comma, I'm going to go, you know, my, my wife's like, what is wrong with you? Right? And we need one of these little mics that uh, translates Ebonics too, right? Because I'd be, I'd be saying things I understand and the, and the thing would be like, what? <laughs> okay, here we go. Done properly, comma. Preaching is simply the representation of God's gospel, God's good news, by which men and women come to know him. And the second sentence is this. Thus, preaching mediates God himself. That's Don Carson, D.A. Carson, the cross and Christian ministry. It's this little meditation on the first few chapters of uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it is. 
Yep, the second sentence. Yep. Thus, preaching mediates God himself. And we'll, we'll unpack what's meant there in a moment. The second quote is, is very similar. It's from the book I referenced uh, a moment ago, T. David Gordon's Why Johnny Can't Preach. Um, excellent book if you've not read it on preaching. Um, passionate, passionate plea um, to a certain kind of preaching. Here's what he says. The content of Christian preaching should be the person, character, and work of Christ. The substance of our proclamation is the soteric, S-O-T-E-R-I-C, meaning salvation or salvific, is the soteric fitness of the person and character of Christ and the soteric competence of his work. What is offered to the congregation in rightly ordered Christian worship is nothing less than Christ himself. So let me give it to you again. The content of Christian preaching, or we might say Christ-centered preaching, the content of Christian preaching should be the person, character, and work of Christ. Second sentence. The substance of our proclamation is the soteric fitness of the person and character of Christ, meaning that, that he is fit to be our Savior, how it is that Jesus is fit to be our Savior, and the soteric competence of his work, um, how it is that Jesus is able to save us, right? The effectiveness of his work, the soteric competence of his work. Then he says this a little while later in the paragraph, what is offered to the congregation in highly ordered Christian worship is nothing less than Christ himself. Okay, everybody get that one? Who wanted to get that one? Okay. Now, what I want to suggest, or what these writers suggest, is that Christ-centered preaching has two elements. There's a content element, and then there's a presentation element. In the content, Christ-centered sermons really focus on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Who Jesus is, what he's like, what he has done in the world to save sinners, what he's going to do in the world and the universe to, to complete his redemption. So that's what Christ-centered preaching is going to tell us about. It's going to tell us about Jesus and what Jesus has done to save us. Uh, and so our, our, our listeners should be hearing that. They should be hearing something about the character of God from a particular text, right? They should be hearing something about the work of God in Jesus Christ from a particular text. They should be hearing the the, the Lord's cross and resurrection and his coming again, right? So, so the text in Christ-centered preaching should be preached in such a way that it leads us to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, right? But now, secondly, both of these writers writing years apart and, and as far as I know, unconnected from each other, both of these writers bring forth a second thing that I, that I find just really, really profound. And it's this. Christ-centered preaching, in the words of D.A. Carson, mediates God himself. And in the words of T. David Gordon, is nothing less than Christ himself. Now let that sink in. We're talking about a kind of preaching that represents, not represents, but represents Jesus to his people through the preached word. The content presents a person. In this, in this way, the, in Christ-centered preaching, the Son of God visits his people afresh. So every Sunday is the day of visitation for the people who hear this kind of preaching. 
right? So if, so if God inhabits the praises of his people, if God inhabits the, the preaching as an act of praise, then, then Jesus is very much present with us as we lift him up, as we proclaim his excellencies, as we celebrate his cross work, as we unpack his character, right? Christ is present with us in this kind of preaching. So this, this kind of preaching differs from other kinds of preaching in, in those two respects. The content focuses on Jesus and his completed work, but in the act of preaching itself, Jesus is mediated to his people. He is represented to his people. He is with his people, Jesus himself, in the preaching of the word. Now, that view of preaching leads me to at least three convictions. Now, convictions are a funny thing. Uh, I may have them, you may not, right? And, and they may be great for me to have, and you may have different ones. So in offering these as convictions, I'm not giving you some new law, right? Uh, but I do think they're good and right. Conviction number one, we should preach Jesus and the gospel from every text in a way that's natural to that text. We'll, we'll unpack these. Let me give you these three convictions, and we'll unpack them. So we should preach Jesus and the gospel from every text in a way that is natural and appropriate to that text. Okay? Number two, if those two quotes from Carson and Gordon represent Christ-centered preaching, then the second conviction I have is this, is we must never preach ourselves, brothers. We must never preach ourselves. And then number three, as I said a moment ago or alluded to, if this is what is happening in the preaching, if there's something happening not just with the content but also with the presence of the Lord in the preaching, then, then our preaching, we should really preach as an act of faith, worship, and love. Right? That preaching is not merely an intellectual exercise. It is not merely a duty um, that we perform on Sundays. That is certainly not how we sort of receive applause and, and, and accolades for ourselves. It's none of that, merely. It is actually something we do as part of how we as preachers walk by faith. And it's something we do as worshipers. That preaching is a part of the worship, right? I'd argue the central part, and it's something we do out of love for God and for his people, right? If, if what we're doing is representing Jesus to his people, then those things should be motivating our preaching, right? So three convictions. Let me unpack them uh, a little bit. And again, if you reach different convictions, as the Bible says, let every man be convinced in his own mind, right? So... First, preach Jesus from every text. Now, when I say that, what I'm not saying is that, you know, you, we preach for 30 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour and 30 minutes, however long it is, and then at the end, we tack on a little Jesus. Okay? I don't think that's the best of gospel preaching. I'll take it. I'll take that compared to the gospel nowhere ever being cited in a sermon, right? So I'm not dogging it. I just think we could do better. Right, so we're not talking about, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about from this text for however long a time, and then, oh, by the way, i got to somehow slap a little Jesus on it, right? That, that's not, we can do better than that, right? So the best preaching, I don't think, is presenting a kind of routine gospel presentation that has nothing to do with the actual scripture in front of us, right? The specific text should help us to reach Jesus in a specific way. So, yes, we're going to preach history as history and show how Jesus fulfills that history. And again, we can see the models for this, for example, in the New Testament. You think about Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, where Matthew seems to be reinterpreting Israel's history in Egypt in light of Jesus' going down to Egypt as an infant. 
And then he applies it, Matthew 2.15, out of Egypt I have called my son. Right? Well, he's taking something that was said of the whole nation Israel and showing how that is being fulfilled, right, in the, in the sort of life events of Christ himself. So that he's, he's taken, if, he were, if that were a sermon, imagine that were a sermon for a moment, and he was preaching that passage um, of, of Israel's history, um, that would be a way of coming to Jesus in a way that's natural to the historical text that Matthew had in mind. You tracking with me? Let me give you another example. Just, we should preach the Psalms, right, as poetry. Um, and not just as poetry, but we should maybe really work to show how the Psalms are best understood if we imagine them on Jesus' lips. Sinclair Ferguson says, for example, that almost everything we know about the interior life of the Lord Jesus Christ we learn from the Psalms. And when you read the Gospels, you'll find statements like he had compassion on people or things of that sort. But actually, in terms of the sort of interior life of the Lord, um, most of that's revealed to us actually in the Psalms. And so to read Psalm 88 or any of the Psalms, for example, I think, I think we need to take the themes of that Psalm, appropriate to the life of Christ and the events of Christ's life, and, 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 and see them fulfilled there. And, and get to the gospel through those themes, through those truths. Again, not just in a formulaic way. We, we could go on and on, and, and maybe uh, what we'll do in the, the lectures for tomorrow is we'll take a, few, a couple of passages of Scripture, and we'll try and sort of model this. We'll, we'll actually do some practice on this. But we want to reach Jesus in a specific way, a way that's specific to the text. Uh, sometimes that's laying right there on the page, Right? Real clear reference to Jesus, not a lot of hard work you have to do. But how many of you know to do this well uh, and not to be reading things into the text that aren't there, right? Uh, to do this well takes some work, right? It takes a, a lot of work. So uh, I'm thinking here of, of Edmund Clowney's framework, which I mentioned before. If you don't have the book Preaching Christ from All of Scripture, it's a fantastic resource. Um, the first couple of chapters will repay you know, repay you for the price of that book. Um, he has a framework in here, and if I was a younger man, I would have had slides for y'all, but I'm, I'm an old man, so uh, in, in, for me, an iPad is a legal pad. So, <laughs> so, so uh, you probably can't see that, so I'm going to describe it for you. But um, Clowney has a framework in, in his book that he's, he's dealing with the issue of typology and symbolism. And he's talking about how do you go from typology and symbols in the Old Testament um, to Jesus and application in a healthy way in a New Testament church. And if you imagine, if you draw four boxes on your page, perhaps, you got two boxes up top, two boxes here, making kind of a square. In the, in the bottom left box, uh, you can write the word symbol. Right? So you're in the Old Testament, you see a symbol. What do, you, what do you do with that symbol? How do you interpret that symbol uh, in a way that makes sense in light of who Jesus is? Okay? Then you've got an arrow from your bottom left up to your top left. And in that top left box, you can just write truth. Right? So there's some truth that that symbol is meant to communicate. Right? So somebody give me a symbol from the Old Testament. Any, any symbols come to mind? Ark of the Covenant, temple, right? Old Testament, full of symbols. Tons of symbols, right? So, you know, Clowney is saying, or, yeah, he's saying what we want to figure out is in order to understand that symbol well and, and that symbolism well, we want to move up to this notion of truth. What, what truth is that symbol meant to convey? Uh, most of us probably have a symbol on our left hand, right? The ring, the wedding ring. What does that symbolize? Marriage, commitment. I'm done, you know, what, what, you know so symbolizes all kind of love. Yeah, well, now the thing, about, the thing about a symbol is that a symbol will communicate truth, but what's more important, the symbol or the truth? Yeah, so we've got wedding rings that symbolize so much in terms of covenant and love and commitment, but what's really important is not the metal ring, right, but all those other things that we've committed to with our wives. And so what, what Clowney says we need to do now is we need to walk from that truth over to the box in the top right, and in that box are the words final truth, right? 
And that arrow he calls fulfillment. So we want to walk from that truth, walk from that symbol or that type or that history. We want to walk from that up to the truth that's meant to be stated. And then we want to walk from that truth in the Old Testament over to the top right to that final truth, which is how it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, once we've done that, then we can drop down that last arrow to the bottom right, to the box that says, um, you receive the benefit of truth, or the arrow which says application, right? So that's kind of the, the arc that we want to travel. We want to travel from that text and the things that are in that text, whether it's symbol or whether it's type or whether it's history, whatever the case may be. We want to walk from that text up to the truth that that text is pointing us to, right? And at this point, the text may not say anything at all about Jesus explicitly, right? So we want to find the truth of that text. But then that truth now is going to find this ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And so we want to walk over to Jesus and how Jesus fulfills that truth. And then we want to drop that Jesus-fulfilled truth into the life of the hearer in the form of application. This, now we ask that question, what does this mean to us? Right? You tracking with me? Now, there are some ways of, of traveling in, this sort of, in those sort of four quadrants that actually will lead us to some mistakes. Right? So, for example, let's say you arrive at, at truth um, from some particular text, and then we go from there, from the top left over to the bottom right. So we go from that truth to application, that's going to be moralism, right? That's, that's not going to be Christ-centered preaching. That's going to be a moralistic preaching, right? Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, left his coat in there. You ought to leave your clothing at the other woman's house. That's, that's, bad, that's bad preaching, right? That's bad preaching. Or, or you, ought to, you ought to run out of the house and leave your clothes behind if you have to. Okay, yes, that's true. That's good. You need to avoid places of temptation. That's not wrong. That's not heretical or anything of that sort. That's good. It's just not Christ-centered. Right? We didn't take that step to go to Jesus first and then have Jesus' fulfillment, right, the, the, the bigger Joseph, the greater Joseph, right, shape then how we understand the application. Does that make sense? So that's, that's moralism. And, and you can go from symbol to final truth in a kind of typology, right? And, and again, this is where sometimes we, we start to read things into text that, that aren't really there, that, that aren't really helpful. So we have skipped, we've skipped this issue of what it meant in its original context to its original hearers, and, and we just sort of jumped right over to Jesus. Now, if I could be... Um, iconoclastic for a moment, if I can be maybe a little bit heretical to some of you, this is where I disagree with Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers. When Spurgeon says you take a text and make a beeline to Jesus, no, there's some other stops you got to make along the way. I know what he means. I can give him the benefit of the doubt. But some people having heard Spurgeon, it's like I read my text and then I just jump right over to Jesus. It's like, no, there's a whole people to whom this was written. And it was meaningful for them in their context. And if we want to understand its meaning well, we need to understand that context and its original meaning. Then we come over to Jesus. And then we come down to application, right? So in our preparation, if we're going to preach Jesus and the gospel from every text, we probably should be making our way through some steps that look something like that. we got a text with symbol, history, um, types, all kinds of things in it. We need to interpret that in its original context and arrive at that, that first box of truth. Then we need to move over from that um, to its final, its fulfillment, its ultimate truth in Jesus Christ. And then we need to drop that into the life of our church in the form of application. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns about any of that? And this, is, and this is, I'm raising this in part because this is what helps us to preach the gospel in a way that's natural to the text instead of just sort of tacking on the gospel in a way that doesn't fit, right? Right. 
Yeah, so this is, if you wanted to turn this into a process, yeah, this is a pretty good sort of process. Now, there's a lot of other things you would do in each step along the way, but this is a pretty good sort of stepwise process from a text all the way around to application. Amen. Redeem his land. Uh, but are there particular passages in, say, maybe in the Old Testament, not even maybe considered in Proverbs, uh, where, you, you know, you kind of almost, uh, I know I've heard one of the made some mistakes and stuff. Give you a quick example. Uh, I was listening to a bunch of people one time, they were talking about Rahab, uh, which I think probably very problematic. Red Scarlet, so he took the red scarlet and that represented Christ's blood and all that. So it seems as though, I guess, in Yeah. That's good. That's good. So again, sometimes we can be too creative, right? So you see Rahab with a scarlet thread, and like, oh, let me run that over to Jesus and the blood. Okay, again, you're not. It's not heretical, but I'm not sure that's what that meant to Rahab, right? Uh, you know what I mean? We've never heard of Jesus, and you know, would be centuries before Jesus would come on the scene. So sometimes we can be too creative, right? I think one, of the, and and the question is, how do you guard against that? Well, back to what we said earlier. Let scripture interpret scripture, right? So that's the first step. So it, it, it may be that you're looking at a text that's actually picked up in the New Testament, and the New Testament writers have actually done that interpretive work for us, right? Um, and so Carson, and I forget who he did this book with, uh, Brother Pastor may remember, but he, it, it's a book, and I'm forgetting the title, but it's basically, I think it's called The New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Um, say again? G.K. Bill, fantastic resource, right, where they're looking at basically the New Testament's every use and interpretation of Old Testament passages, right? So a resource like that should live on every preacher's library uh, and bookshelf, okay? Um, G.K. Bill and Don Carson? It's a commentary of the New Testament use of the Old Testament. That's right. A uh, commentary of the New Testament use of the Old Testament. It's like a bunch of mini-commentaries. Yep. Fantastic work. G.K. Bill, B-E-A-L-E. And he did that with Carson, didn't he? Yep. Yep, and Don, Don Carson, D.A. Carson. The commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. It's a clunky title, but it, 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 the title is telling you what the book is really about. It is a thick one. So you don't want to put that in the middle of your bookshelf. Your bookshelf will be sagging <laughs> like that. Say again, it's one book. Yep, it's one nice, massive resource volume. So I think taking, taking a work like that, uh, and seeing how the New Testament writers have, have used that Old Testament passage, checking to see if they have, I think that's really, really quite helpful. Um, or it may not be that the New Testament has quoted that passage directly, but the truth of that passage is discussed in the New Testament in various ways. Right, so just for example, you may have a passage that's on, that's on holiness, Right? And that passage isn't quoted in the New Testament, but my word, there's a ton of data in the New Testament on holiness, right? And so this is where, again, you're doing the good work of a systematic theologian or a biblical theologian. You're gathering up that other teaching, and then you're sort of understanding that text in light of that New Testament teaching, et cetera. So that'd be at least two ways to, to get at that, to, to try and keep ourselves from being fancy um, where, where we shouldn't be, you know? Other thoughts on either that question or other questions? Excellent. So we, we ought from every text of Scripture in a way that's natural and appropriate to that text, preach Jesus and the gospel. Okay? So to put the conviction in another way, I don't actually think you've done, we've done distinctively Christian preaching until we have preached Jesus and the gospel. Right? If we're, particularly if we're preaching the Old Testament and we don't get to Jesus, it's probably a good rabbi sermon, right? If it doesn't get you kicked out of the synagogue for proclaiming who Jesus is and what he's done, the way it got the apostles kicked out of the synagogue, you've not yet gotten to distinctively Christian preaching, Christ-centered preaching, right? Um, and so the thing that's offensive, according to the Scripture, Christ and the cross should be in our text. I mean, it should be in our, in our sermon, excuse me, right? 
And if it's not, we, we maybe ought to pause and ask, why not? What are, we, what are we doing? What are we missing? How do we be more Christ-centered in that way? Okay? That's conviction number one. Conviction number two, never preach ourselves. Never preach ourselves. I mean, you know, we don't have to stay long on this. I think everybody here would agree with me on, on this. I, I hope this is your conviction too. But the very first New Testament preacher was John the Baptist. Standing there between the Testaments, flat-footed, you know, dressed all wild and eating locusts and honey, forerunner proclaiming that Christ is coming. But what does John say about himself? You know it. Whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He must what? Increase and I must decrease. And again, the apostle and others had that, that same attitude of mind. Oh, no, the, the star of the sermon, the star of the ministry, the star of the church is Jesus, not the preacher, not the angels of the church, right? And, and I'm afraid that too many preachers don't sort of have John's mindset. John knew that he was the forerunner and one was coming after him. And too many preachers, I'm afraid, don't realize that Jesus is coming after us too. There's a second coming, right? And when the Lord comes again, we're told in, in 1 Corinthians, he's going to test our work as preachers. Whether it's wood, stay, or uh, hay, or stubble, or, or whether it's the finer materials that we build with, right? All of that's going to be sifted to see what sort that it is. We'll give an account, Jesus says, for every careless or idle word that we speak, Matthew 12, 36. And James says we're going to give a stricter judgment, right? Let not many teach, knowing. And we're going to give a stricter judgment for our words, for our teaching. So as preachers, we don't want to forget we're going to give an account. And we don't want to slide over into preaching ourselves rather than preaching Christ. And there are obvious ways that that can happen, and there are subtle ways that that can happen. Let me give you a subtle way. Um, I think all of us, obviously, have personalities. And I think there's a sense in which we should preach inside of our personalities. I, I don't need to be trying to preach, you know, like, like any of you, because I'm me and you're you. And you don't need to be trying to preach like somebody else. You know how we talk about preaching your own armor, right? You know, talk about taking David's thing and making a symbol out of it that ain't got nothing to do with, you know, so, you know, it's fine. You know, we're we preaching our own armor. I don't want to wear Saul's armor when I preach. You don't want to wear Saul's armor when you preach, right? And so a healthy preacher preaches, you know, as themselves, right? As the man that God has made them to be, right? And yet, personality can cover up the lack of a lot of preparation. And personality can be inserted in such a way as people are looking at you and not Jesus. We don't want to do that, brothers. Not if Christ-centered preaching is presenting again Jesus to the people. You notice I keep doing this gesture, right? We're trying to get Jesus out front and to be seen. We don't want to present him like this. You know, like, this is my dude, Jesus, and we on the same level, and, you know, we just hanging out. No, 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 no. Let him increase and we decrease. Many of you probably pray this great prayer, Lord, hide me behind the cross. Right? We need to mean that prayer. And that means sometimes we need to do things like, pull the personality back just a little bit, right? So if you're particularly funny and God has given you a gift with humor, use it, but not so much that that makes you the star of the sermon. It takes people's eye off Jesus, right? If God's given you a keen mind, a keen intellect, use it, but not so much that people leave the sermon thinking, man, he's so smart. He read a lot of books. Or worse, I don't know, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? Use who God has made you to be in a way that amplifies who Jesus is. Right? 
Sometimes we're preaching ourselves, brethren, or, we, or we, we, we're putting ourselves out there a little bit because we want a little shine, right? And we should, that, just, that should just terrify us. That should mortify us. And we should want to put that to death and ask the Lord to free us from that. And, and this I know in my own heart. Maybe this, 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 these are my convictions. They don't have to be yours. But I know my own heart's temptation to pride, beloved. I know how I feel when someone tells me that was a good sermon. Right? And I know when I am sort of reveling in that and that's puffing me up. I know when I'm doing that and when I'm giving God glory instead. Right? And we have way too many pulpits that have become some man's 15 minutes of fame every Sunday rather than the place where Jesus' glory, the Shekinah, dwells in the preached word. Right? And so there's a work for us to do in being sober-minded about who really is the star of our pulpits and our sermons? And, and what are we drawing attention to? I, again, and not because I'm anybody, but I'm just talking about my own sins. I, I, I do try to practice the idea that I'm the worst sinner I know, right? I could preach in such a way, naturally, let me do this a different way. I, as a person, I'm wired for intensity. So 50 pounds ago, I used to be a good basketball player, right? <laughs> 50 pounds ago, 25 years ago, used to be nice with the rock. And the older I get, the better I was, right? <laughs> and, so, and so, but I played angry, right? Very intense, very angry, um, aggressive. It's how I played. It's how I did a lot of things in life, right? And before I was a Christian and was a speaker on campuses and was a Muslim, et cetera, et cetera, I could preach out of that anger, out of that intensity, and it has an impact on people, right? So I was speaking and preaching long before I was a pastor. But that's the flesh. I could preach out of that. I could impact people. I could give people a sense of intensity, and I can tell them, that that maybe is the awe of God that's come over you, right? But that's me. That's me. That's, that's, not, that's not Jesus. And so just thinking about my own personal, my own personality, I spent a lot of time pulling that back, putting the old man to death, right, and, and not relying on that and, quote, unquote, risking a less engaging, less entertaining, less something, stylish form of preaching. Because what does the New Testament say? What does Paul say? We, we want their faith to rest on the power of God, not the eloquence of man. Right? Right? So Christ-centered preaching means that there needs to be the death of the preacher. Right? So that Christ comes through more clearly and more powerfully. That means different things for different people. So I, I need to be less intense. I need to pull back. Whatever that is for you, I mean, that's, that's, that's for you and the Lord to kind of talk about. You Maybe you're just fine. Praise God, right? Um, but that's, that's what I think has, has grown up for me as a conviction, that if the Word is the star, if Jesus is the star, the beauty must decrease and Christ increase. Right? And that's been there since John the Baptist for us preachers, right, to follow. Yeah? You tracking with me? Yes. Okay, I'm off that soapbox. Number three, and quickly, excuse me, we should preach as an act of faith, worship, and love. Again, I don't have to say a whole lot about this uh, except to say that, again, not to project onto you guys, but just to be, we're here as brothers, and just to be a brother and to open up my own life a little bit. In my first pastorate, in the Cayman Islands, uh, I hit a season where it dawned on me that I was not enjoying preaching, that um, it felt professional to me, and it, and it felt kind of routine. I was putting together sermons, and I was delivering the sermons, and 
Um, despite what was happening in my heart, people seemed to be blessed by the sermons and blessed by the word. I could see ways in which the congregation was growing spiritually. But my own, my own soul, as it related to preaching, felt, felt empty, felt barren. And it's to the point where I was thinking, maybe I should leave the ministry and do something different. And I praise God for godly wives who know how to chin check you when you need to be chin checked. And, and, and my wife said some things to me that I thought, oh, okay, all right, you've been talking to Jesus. Leave me, leave me alone. All right. uh, and she helped me. And about that time, I had this book, man, I must have had this book for 10 years and never read it. John Stott's uh, Between Two Worlds. Yeah, and about that time I thought, you know, I'm slow. I should read some books on preaching, right? I should, I should read something about this thing to see if it reignites something. And I remember Saturday morning uh, there on the island in the room reading John Stott, and those opening couple of chapters saved my preaching ministry because it awakened in me again a love for preaching and this sense that this was not my profession this was my privilege, and this was not my job. This was a part of my worship, right? And I should be preaching as an act of love for Christ and his word and his people. Um, and that just, that revived me as it related to preaching. And so I just want to encourage you um, that if any of you are sort of in seasons like that or have known seasons like that, just want to encourage you um, to, to sort of Return to your first love in that way. And to return to preaching as an act of faith and worship and love in that sense. So that's my definition of Christ-centered preaching. A quote from Carson and Gordon and a couple of convictions for me that flow out of those definitions. Before we keep moving to sort of a next point here on Christ-centered preaching, let me just pause and see if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. I, no, I don't think it took that form. Um, I think I was experiencing a pretty deep fatigue, what, what um, Lloyd-Jones might call a spiritual depression in some ways. Um, and the, the sort of thought that came out of that was, maybe I should go do something different, right? Now, I don't, I, I assume, you know, people here may have different views of calling, but I don't understand that a man is necessarily called to preaching his, his entire life. That, that might be a season. Uh, and the Lord might move them on to something else. That's probably why I didn't think about it you know, in quite those terms. But um, I think I was responding more out of the sense of spiritual despondency um, that, that I was experiencing at the time. It's a good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> indeed, indeed. It's, well, it's hard in one sense. It, in another sense, it's really quite easy because all you're doing is letting the text say what it's saying, right? So I don't, I don't feel my, I'm not a clever preacher or it, there, there are other guys I watch, I'll be like, man, the Lord didn't give me none of that, right? I just, I did just look so effortlessly and so good. I wish I could do that. The, the Lord didn't give me any of that, right? But this commitment to exposition, I, I think for me has been, uh, one of the benefits of it has been the recognition is like, oh, there's a sense in which preaching is really easy. All I need to do is read the text, explain the text, preach Jesus from the text, and apply it, right? Then I sit down. Now, I can make that more or less complex. So part of what was happening to me in those years in the Cayman Islands when I was losing some, some life in preaching um, 
was, was I was preaching the commentary too much, right? I had this sense as a, as a young preacher in his first pastorate, I had this sense that I got to get it right. And sometimes that can be dialed up so high, right, that you really do begin to think it's all on you. And that's exhausting. That's exhausting because you're not preaching as an act of faith, right? And so I was in all the commentaries and making sure I didn't miss something. And, and you know, I mean, even for obvious verses, right? And it's just like, well, maybe there's something here in the Greek or the Hebrew that I didn't see. And, and, and it was just, it was also a, 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 an exercise in anxiety, right? Instead of letting the word do the work, right? So sometimes, at least for me, that's what was happening earlier on. And here's what I noticed. God was really gracious, and I'll, I'll get around to answering your question in a more succinct way, but God was really gracious. Here's what I noticed at the door after the services. The sermons that I thought were great, <laughs> right, that, that I thought reflected all the work I had been doing, people would walk out and they would greet me, but they wouldn't give me any compliments, man. <laughs> they just sort of walk out. <laughs> they would leave the service and, you know, be like, dang, you know. Nothing. I go home with no encouragement, man. Right? And there would be weeks, as we all have, where the sermon prep time wasn't what I wanted it to be, and I didn't get to do this and didn't get to do that, but I stood up there and I preached, right? And and I would leave the pulpit thinking, man, that dog won't hunt, man. I don't know. That sermon, man, you know, just back there sulking, and almost everybody would leave the church like, Pastor, you were walking down my street today, and that was so helpful. And and I, when I was like, well, seemed like when I prepared less, the people get more. Right? And I don't want to suggest that as a ministry philosophy. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But sometimes, brothers, less is more. Right? And I do think that there are sometimes there are guys who are over preparing and, and their sermons are stilted and academic rather than dynamic and dialogical. Right? Um, so there is a place for less, and now I'm coming to my answers to your question, right? So you describe a guy who's preaching three sermons a week, I would have one service if I could, right? So, so I just preach once on Sunday and midweek Bible study, so I would do less. Now, he may not be able to do that. So here's where the second thing is really important, for me at least, share your pulpit. Share your pulpit. There's no rule that he has to do all three of those sermons. He has a job, 2 Timothy 2, to train other people to preach and to do what he does. Well, now you've got, now he's got in his, the life of his church more opportunity to do that than I do because he's got three services a week. Okay, give that Wednesday night to your assistant. Give that Sunday morning to a, a lay elder. You know, share your pulpit. Team preach, team teach, right? That, that creates margin for rest, right? And he may want, I don't know what, what he's doing in the pulpit, how long his sermons are, how he's approaching that, but he may want to preach shorter sermons. Yeah. So instead of an, an hour for each sermon, you got three hours now a week, and you're spending 12 hours for each of those sermons to be prepared, that's 39 of your 40 hours, right? Ain't no time in there to be with his people. No time in there to do all the other things that, that ministers need to do. Preach shorter sermons. Preach a 30-minute sermon, Right? 25-minute sermon, 40-minute sermon. Shorten things as much as you're able and, be, and, and can be faithful, right? Um, it's the word that does the work, right? And that might be a situation where that understanding is being tested, right? That the word is what does the work. Um, and, and that may be a situation where less is more. And so that's, that's what I would say. So just share the pulpit, sit under the ministry of others so that your soul is fed too, Right? Um, and just to make that more concrete, and, and I realize not every pastor is in a situation like this, but I, I think, I tell my people, I feel like I'm doing my job if I'm in the pulpit about 60, 65% of the time, right? I hit that two-thirds mark as the main preacher, I think I'm doing my job. And so when I lay out, I plan my sermons uh, in four-month blocks. When I lay out the next four months, as I'll do uh, in about a week or so, um, I, I, I go, okay, if there's 16 Sundays, I need to be in the pulpit about 12, 11 or 12 of those Sundays. That means there are about five Sundays where I'm going to have somebody else preach, right? 
Um, so just plan your rest, take your rest, uh, sit under the ministry of the word. My congregation loves to hear other men preach, right? They, they just ex- rejoice to see God's gifting in other men. Our congregation in God's grace doesn't mind if a man struggles up there, right? Not a regular preacher. Maybe it's the first time they preached a sermon. They're out there cheering. They're praying, you know, and, and they're looking for the grace of God and the word of God and whatever's happening up there. And he may have been a complete wreck on that Sunday. Now, I don't put him up there next Sunday, <laughs> right? All right? We're like, come with me to Pastor Jack's conference and let's, let's, let's get you some equipping, you know? Um, but I think in this sense, we should, we, should, we should often take more risk with our people than we do. The Spirit's in them. The grace of God is at work in them. If it's a young man who shows promise and loves God's word, and again, they don't need to be you, Right? And so share the pulpit, I think, is, is really important in terms of preventing that burnout, getting some rest, establishing some rhythms that make sense when you've got a preaching load that, that's that big. Is that helpful? Amen. Sorry for, sorry for the long-winded round-the-robin answer there. Yeah. Other questions, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. Let me hold that, hold that thought. That's the next point I'm coming to. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my discipleship as a preacher has largely come through the influence of, of two men, personally. A fellow by the name of Pete Rochelle. It's my first pastor uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's the first expositor that I sat under. And when I think of Shepherd, if, you know, his picture is beside that word in the dictionary, right? Gentle, loving, sweet man, preach God's word, clear, just lay it out, right? And then Mark Dever at Capitol Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. And I think between those two men, one of the things that... Um, has been a gift to me is an emphasis on faithfulness. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, right, that we are stewards of the mysteries of God, and, you know, as stewards, we we should be found faithful. That's really the measure of ministry. And that's been drilled into my head and my heart so many years for so long. And then sitting in a church like Capitol Hill, which in some ways... um, you know, Mark and his emphasis on training young pastors, he, he thinks of the church in part as kind of like a teaching hospital. You know, come there you, to make the rounds with the, with the head doctor and, you know, send young guys out. And God's used that marvelously. But guys leave there with that smoke in their clothes. Have you ever been into a smoky restaurant or a pool hall or a gas station? You come out and you're like, you don't even smoke, but you smell like Marlboro. You're like, eh, yeah. Right? Guys can leave there with that smoke in their clothes, really thinking, okay, it needs to be done this way and kind of rigid, or really thinking, I got to get this right. I need to be faithful, right? And I didn't know it, but that was me going to my first pastor. It's like, I, I got to get this right. I, I want to be faithful, and there's a way to do things, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody had ever told me that explicitly, but that's what I had sort of began to, to drink in. And it, it, it did. It created, a, it created a kind of anxiety, a low-level chronic anxiety about preaching well and preaching right and getting the text right and all those things. And I was, I was preoccupied with that in an unhealthy way, like I said. And, and, and that would show itself, for example, in, you know, spending 25 hours on a sermon and a good 10 of those hours was in commentaries, right, because I got to read all the commentaries. I got to see what everybody said and da 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 and then writing a sermon manuscript, which is more fitting for a seminary lecture than preaching to people who worked at grocery stores and worked as nannies or worked, or worked in um, mutual funds. And, you know, they, they weren't thinking about this stuff. You know, we, and so I was not really serving them well in that, right? And so that was, that was the getting it right bit. Right, which was this kind of perversion of faithfulness in that in that sense, 
Um, and so I had to learn to relax. I remember I had an elder who said to me, um, and, and, and he and I used to kind of bump heads a bit, but he was giving me feedback on the sermon, and, which he did almost every week. <laughs> it was just like, Lord, have mercy. And, uh, and he was a lovely man. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. He's just a lovely man, a gem of a man. Um, but we, we, were, we were starting to, you know, have some friction. And I remember him saying to me one day in frustration, he said, you, you, you might, you're taking this, this faithfulness stuff too seriously, which to me sounded like heresy. I was like, and I remember that weekend, my wife and I, we took the kids to the beach. We're sitting on the beach. And as it was, I was reading T. David Gordon's book, what, you know, Why Johnny Can't Preach, right? When I was reading that book and we're sitting on the beach. I said, baby, let me ask you something. Can you take faithfulness too seriously? You know, and, you know, just not knowing the context, she was like, I, I don't think so, right? I said, that's, that's what he said to me. That's what he said to me. I was all indignant about it. And about a year later, I was like, I think he was right. <laughs> I, think, I, think he was, I, think, I think he was right. He saw some stuff there. So um, part of what was helpful for me was, was in time learning to even listen to my fellow leaders who, who might have had a different perspective that I didn't receive initially but proved to be right, and learning to relax and seeing that actually the sermons that seem to bless people seem to be sermons that, you know, I didn't put all that time into, and, and, um, and yet it was clear and, and, and accurate to the text, and, and, and remembering again, it's the Word that does the work, right? It's not the work that I did on the Word that does the work. It's the Word that does the work. Let the Word loose, right? Um, and so that's how the Lord began. I hope that's helpful to your question. That's how the Lord began to, began to help me in a bit. And ministry, ministry life began to be more satisfying, honestly, uh, and more joyful in that way. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. I think what happens is we start to, in a, in a subtle way, we're really trusting ourselves. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's undue pressure. I can't fail. Yeah. I gotta get this right. That's right. When in reality, no, uh, it's what God's gonna do through you. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, and in spite of in spite of you, that's right. Actually, you start to man, you're telling the truth now, Dad. That's right. You know, I got to cross every, you know. That's right. And yeah. Yeah, we become pragmatists in that way. Yeah, so there's yeah. no delight. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We're trusting ourselves when we're trusting God when it, when it gets to be that way. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's a dangerous calling, brothers. So let me move to the second notion then in terms of what is Christ-centered preaching. I gave you the definitions a moment ago, but now I want to show you a connection that Christ-centered preaching must teach Christ-centered living. Coming to the question about do we ever address um, social issues and things of that sort. Christ-centered preaching must teach Christ-centered living. And, and I want to use two, two quotes again here as a way of framing this out. Again, the first one is from T. David Gordon, Why Johnny Can't Preach. He says, Christian procl proclamation properly includes the shaping of a Christian moral vision. And preaching Christ crucified does not exclude, but intentionally includes such a vision. But it is never appropriate, in my estimation, for one word of moral counsel ever to proceed from a Christian pulpit that is not clearly, in its context, redemptive. Right? So we shouldn't be preaching morality without Jesus and redemption. That's what that second sentence means. Let me give you the first sentence again, because that's, that's where the connection is. Christian proclamation properly includes the shaping of a Christian moral vision. And preaching Christ crucified does not exclude, but intentionally includes such a vision. 
So what he's saying there, if you're really properly doing Christ-centered preaching, again, you're not just preaching Jesus in some theological abstract sense, but you are bringing Jesus down into also a moral vision, a, a vision for the right life, the righteous life, the good life, right? You're teaching people how to walk in that wisdom that comes from Christ. And that then means that we're going to declare the whole counsel of God through Christ on the whole life of God's people, right? So I want to suggest to you that any preaching that says, hey, here are some topics that are off limit, limits, ceases to be Christian preaching. It ceases to be the kind of preaching, Christian preaching that declares all of life must be lived under the lordship of Jesus Christ. All of life, your political life, right? Your relationship life, your financial life, right? All of life, pick your issue, is to be lived under the lordship of Christ. That, that means there's a, there's a moral vision that the people of God are meant to have that is shaped by who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and his rule in our life through his word, Right? So I, I want to suggest to you that on that basis, there's a lot of cowardice in the pulpit. And it's killing the church. The confusion, the conflict, the consternation, the division that's in the church right now is satanic in its origin, and it's aided by cowardice in the pulpit. You smell sulfur everywhere today. Because we have been a generation of preachers who have said, I preach the gospel, not politics. Now, if by politics you mean partisanship, I'm with you. I don't, I'm not trying to disciple you into the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or the Green Party or a Tea Party. I, none of that. So if you mean partisanship, I'm with you. Because there's a sense in which the truth is Jesus is Lord. And our loyalty is to him, not to party, right? But if you mean that you're not going to teach your people how to think Christianly about the moral issues that take political form, you are failing to disciple your people and you're failing to do Christ-centered preaching in its finest sense. So moral issues that take political form. I'll give you a couple examples. Easy example, abortion. It's a moral issue. It's being debated in political form. Should we stack the Supreme Court? Will the Supreme Court overturn it? They've overturned it. Now what does it mean at the state courts? Da, 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 da. It's been all sort of had in the political sort of sphere, even though at bottom, like all political issues, it's a moral issue. Life and the meaning of life and how we protect life. Well, let me give you another example. Police reform. It's a moral issue. How those who are entrusted with the power of the state, who are entrusted with the sword, Romans 13, who can, who can execute or lead to execution, how they wield that kind of power is a question of immense moral significance. And we need Christian reasoning to get it right, to get it right. So you got folks out there hollering, defund the police. Wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, what you mean by that? Okay, because there's a police function that's legitimate and necessary, right? But we also have a police force that in most places are asked to do more than they should be asked to do. Shouldn't be getting your cat out the tree. <laughs> Should, shouldn't be responding to mental health calls. Right? So there's a, there's a conversation there about the moral use of power and how it's being played out in something like police. I mean, we would just, that's just to use examples right, that are in the news every day. Right? We don't want churches full of people who are not equipped to be ambassadors of, ambassadors of Christ in those conversations. I would go so far to say, we actually want to preach and teach and disciple in such a way that we give at least some people in our congregations a vision for that as their vocation to go into politics as Christians, 
to go into government as Christians, to go into police, brothers, policemen and firemen, to go into police departments as Christians with the mind of Christ, trying to be salt and light, trying to advance good moral vision and reasoning. I mean, what else are we doing in the world if we're not raising up those kind of people in the name of Christ and for the service of Christ, right? So I was supposed to give you two quotes. I got off on my soapbox a little too early. Let me give you a second quote. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a second quote. It's from Jeffrey Thomas in a book called Preaching, The Man, The Message, The Method. Good short little book on preaching. He says, preaching is omnipotent, cap- capital O. So he's it's his word, he's using that word for God, right? Preaching is omnipotence doing four things. Regenerating, instructing, convicting, and redeeming sinners. And then he says this, that they may love God and be like him. In other words, preaching is a saving and sanctifying act of God, Right? So I'll give it to you again. Preaching is omnipotence, regenerating, instructing, convicting, and redeeming sinners that they may love God and be like him. Second sentence. In other words, preaching is a saving and sanctifying act of God. Now, when he says that, it's a, a, that, that, that we preach that our people may not only love God but be like him, I think he's including in that, right, the sort of replay and the demonstration of God's character in God's people. What is that if not moral, right? And what is, what is morality if not an application to how we live, right? So we want both Christ-centered preaching and Christ-centered living And we don't quite have the best form of Christ-centered preaching unless that preaching then begins to touch on and to shape Christ-centered living, right? And that's going to mean addressing things that, you know, declaring the whole counsel of God to the whole person, the whole community of God in terms of the things that we face, right? Um, So, yes, I take that to mean um, that that application is a vital part of, of our preaching. It shouldn't be moralistic. Um, but those, those points of living should be brought under the lordship of Christ. Uh, and as I said before, I think one of the great crimes of, of preaching in this last, at least, at least since I've been alive and, and observant of the church, the last 30 years or so, is that our application, our, our Christ in an application, has neglected for so long, uh, has been neglected for so long, in favor of five steps to do this and three ways to do that, right? Um, We've become pragmatists in that way, in terms of how we think about the Christian life. And in that way, we've often been disconnected from the the redemptive work of Christ itself in terms of thinking about application and how to live this out. And there have been folks who have stepped right into into that void. They've stepped right into that empty space and taken over for us. CNN has stepped into that space and taken over for us. Fox and MSNBC has stepped into that space and taken over for us. Um, college professors have, um, secular institutions have stepped into that space and, and, and taken over for us uh, because we have not too often done the job we could do of, of pressing the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done into the lives of our people calling them to sort of shape their lives around who Jesus, Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Um, and and we're, reaping, we're reaping the bitter fruit of it, right? So our job in the pulpit doesn't end. Uh, it isn't done until we give Christ crucified and resurrected moral vision and instruction uh, to our people. Not until we help our people Uh, not only to see Jesus, but also to seek to be like Jesus, have we really done our job there, right? And so let me end with just a a real quick, uh, one final quote. What's the goal of all of this? Um, To quote again from Jeffrey Thomas in that same book, Preaching the Man, the Message, the Method. He says, let us build up a happy church, which loves the whole counsel of God. Don't aim for anything less than this. That is the New Testament goal, right? So we preach this way 
for the happiness of our people in Christ. Not, not their happiness in the world, but their happiness in Christ, right? Uh, and so we, we declare the whole counsel. The whole counsel of God is necessary for that happiness. Um, and that's the goal of the New Testament, that we would have a people who find their greatest delight, their greatest joy in the Son of God and in living for the Son of God. Right? So that would be my rough definition of Christ-centered preaching using those writers. Let me stop there. Questions, comments, concerns before we break for lunch? I assume we break at 12 for lunch? 12.30? Okay, great. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns? Pushback, right? So, I, you know, iron sharpens iron. If, if something seems off, off balance in what I've said or out of proportion, please push back or offer other thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't actually think that's our work. So our work is to preach the scripture line upon line, right? Precept upon precept, and to let the scripture give the weight and the balance to things, right? Um, so when we are now sort of in our preaching, attempting to sort of say this sin or this category of sins are worse than these sins, we're probably doing something different than the text, right? So if we're letting the text do the work, that's actually a, a question that the text doesn't raise right? Uh, so we just let the text do the work, right? And we can preach on abortion and all of its moral gravity without having to sort of diminish the moral gravity of something else. Now, in an intellectual sense, we could say, hey, abortion is the worst sin going on. If we view it from the numbers of lives lost, it's worse than anything else going on. Okay, I have some sympathy for that. It's like, okay, but I'm preaching to particular persons, Right? And there may be a person out there whose issue isn't abortion at all, but they are racked with guilt about their sexual sin or racked with guilt about how they're mistreating their children, right? Now, I don't necessarily need them to sort of enter into some evaluation about whether or not we're putting things on the same level. I actually need to respond, them to respond to the sense of conviction that God, the Spirit, is pressing upon them about their sin about their particular sin, right? So as a preacher, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just taking the scripture and, and laying out the scripture and dealing with the scripture. Let me give you another example of, of, of where I think we could be tempted to, to, to maybe be trying to sort of figure out what's worse or not, right? Homosexuality. So, so in, in evangelical circles, homosexuality is the scarlet letter, you know, it's, it's this, ooh, you know, uh, same-sex marriage and all the things that go with it. It's just ruining society, et cetera, et cetera. But if I look in Paul's catalog of sins in Romans 1 or 1 Corinthians 6, Romans 1, it gets more airtime. But in most places, if it's listed, 1 Timothy 1, um, 1 Corinthians 6, it's one among many sins that are listed, right? And I'm not to think that disobedience to parents is less serious in God's sight than homosexuality. I just, that's not what the text is telling me, right? The text says, and take 1 Timothy 1, for example, 10 and 11, that all of that is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the, to the gospel, right? So if my people are sitting out there listening to a list of things, all of which are contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel, all of which could lead them to condemnation if they're not repentant believers, the thing I don't want them doing is thinking about which one's worse. I want them thinking about which one's mine. <laughs> right? Right? And then turning to the gospel, turning to Christ for the grace that God gives for their sins. So as our Presbyterian friends put it in, in one of their statements, we want our people to learn to, to confess their particular sins particularly, right? 
And I think a lot of, a lot of our preaching and a lot of our discussion about these things uh, sort of are up here, right, in, in conceptual ways when the Scripture keeps bringing it down here into our lives. And that's what I would want to do in the pulpit. Now, outside the pulpit, having some conversations, maybe it's a panel discussion or some other things, or I'm just talking, and you mentioned the young woman that you're talking to, et cetera. I think there are plenty of other places where we can enter into those kinds of conversations, and they're good conversations to have, right? Um, and, and we might say, yeah, in, in terms of just sheer scope, right, of death, there's nothing that's comparing to abortion right now, right? That's a fine conversation to have. In the pulpit, I want the text to drive what I'm saying and doing there. That's, that's all. That's a long-winded way of saying what I'm saying there. Does that make sense? I love those leading questions. You wouldn't disagree, though. <laughs> So a couple but, but, but still we need to see how it applies to me personally. Yeah. So a couple, a couple things I would say, um, or a couple things that come to mind. So if we're talking about categories of sin, we could, we could think of something like Paul's lines in, I believe it's Corinthians, where he talks about, he's talking about sexual immorality, mm-hmm. sees sins done in the body mm-hmm. and sin done outside the body, right? So there's a categorization there. Mm -hmm. We could take the the two tables of the commandments and talk about a kind of categorization, that the first four commandments have to do with our responsibilities to God, the the last six have to do with our responsibility to our neighbors, Mm -hmm. right? And so we could could categorize things, yes, right? So I don't don't mean to be suggesting there's no categorization that we could do. We, We could talk about sins of speech. We could talk about sins of... Um, omission and sins of commission, sure, right? Leviticus 4, whole chapter on unintentional sins. Yeah, because I'm thinking right. about the punishment yeah, but, uh, but being, this... being in agreement with, with the action. So in right. other words, there are some things that you could do that actually could cost you your life. Sure. There are some things that you could do that just simply cost you a smack on the hand. Well, but we're talking about sin. Right? And if I'm guilty in one point of the law, I'm guilty of the whole law. So, so this is the second thing I wanted to get to. I think beneath these questions is, the, for me, the question of how do we handle this subject pastorally? What is it pastorally that I want my people to understand and to sort of go away with in these conversations? So... If all I'm trying to do pastorally is give people categorization, I'm not sure how helpful that is. Especially if that categorization tends them to somehow think more lightly of their sin. I want to go the other direction. I want them to take their sin more seriously. Not to the point where they cave in on themselves as if there is no Savior, but to the point where they run to that Savior more and more, even over the so-called slap on the hand, because that slap on the hand, apart from Jesus, gets you condemned eternally. It's no light thing. It's, yes, light conceptually in comparison to some other things that may cost you your physical life and be really terrible, but it's all terrible. It's all on the side of terrible, right? So 
what I, what I find more common in my people, is this tape, this ain't, this is, I don't know if this tape or what, but I find more common in the people the Lord has entrusted to me is a tendency to rationalize their sin and, and, to, and to try and move toward minimizing their sin. That's the bigger danger to me than, than people who are sort of, you know, maybe miscategorizing things or not understanding that there are categories or that we could talk about those kinds of things. No, I, I'm actually pastorally more concerned that we develop an abhorrence to sin, that we see it for the enemy that it is, and that we run to the Savior, our captain, our victor, you know, against it. We're, again, whether we judge it small compared to something else, et cetera, I don't want my people I don't think God wants any of his people to be the Pharisee at prayer saying, thank God I'm not like this publican, a sinner. That's a real danger, right? So I know you, I think your question was getting at a different point. You were trying to sort of, I think, illustrate how, how massive a sin that is and, and concern and, and to say, do we preach, do we include that in our preaching? Yeah, but, he, he, but he, what, this, this is what I want to know. You can help me. I'm going to just help you. What was their point in doing that? Uh, I don't know. I'm just, just guessing. I'm just saying, I, I guess it was, it, it did say that there's a degrees of sin, and degrees of punishment. Here's what, here's, I mean, no, I'm I'm right. So uh, my guess is this. My guess is this. There's nobody in hell saying, I got a little bit better than that guy. <laughs> Right? What's the, what's the pastoral benefit of having your people think that way is my point, right? Unless, now, unless, now what, I, what I would guess, I didn't hear the sermon, I don't know those guys. What I'm guessing is they're trying to dial up the sense of importance around abortion. But I, I wouldn't do it that way, right? So, so I've, I've opened sermons or included in sermons stats on abortion. I've, you know, done all kinds of things to sort of help my people understand its seriousness, but I hope I've never done it in a way that even unintentionally implies that other things that could be soul damning are somehow less serious, right? That's all I'm pushing back against. It's like, yeah, preach on it. If the text is there, preach it. Preach it in, if there are categories in the text. You, I, I, so I'm the guy who's like, always tell the people what the text is saying. If that's what the text is saying, preach it. Put your weight on it, right? No problem with that. Use it in illustration. Bring in the facts. Bring in the sort of anecdote that you shared a moment ago. That's great. Give your people a, 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 a well-rounded understanding of anything that you feel like the Lord is calling you to address in the life of your people, you know, through a text. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I would just hope that we would be careful not to do that in a way that diminishes other things that God has said he will judge eternally. Right? That's, that's my point here. So we need to be careful how we do that. I got a hand here and then back over here. As is the case with all the other sins. But, but, when, but wouldn't you say that's true of all the other sins? So, so Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed, pre present continuous, is right now being revealed against the unrighteousness of man. And then in Romans 1, it goes through a whole list of things, right? So, so, I, so my point is, yes to what you're saying, but not just homosexuality, theft, lying, disobedience to parents, to all the sins, there are consequences right now. To those things. But to make them understand, and pastorally to make them understand. Who's the them? The, the parishioners. Right. To make them understand. We understand. 
Right. Right. But that's but are you saying that's only true of homosexuality? No. I'm okay. Saying, I'm saying I'm saying what we want to do is to make them understand Amen. that they're suffering. I mean, we see our parishioners suffering here. That's right. And we want to make sure that they understand well what we're doing is we're not gonna really suffer for that because that's what we're doing. No, I see. There, 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 are real, there are real life consequences to disobedience to God. Yeah. That, that we suffer both in this life and if unrepented, in the life to come. Uh, Absolutely. So you started with, with homosexuality, so I thought you were signaling that out. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm with you on that. Go ahead, brother. J- jump in the mosh pit, man. Come on. <laughs> That's right. The purpose of you doing that is not to excuse the death of the Lord. That's right. Rather to say your sin is That's right. in your eyes less mm-hmm. in some ways. Mm-hmm. But the judgment is is worse. So That's right. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater, right? So it, it moves in that direction. It's like, you thought that was bad. It's going to be worse for you in that day, right? He doesn't argue that, oh, this is really bad. Come back down here. You're a little bit better than, right? And, and not that anybody's saying that, but, but that's what I think we want to avoid in that way. Yeah, we want to move in the direction that Jesus moves. With that. Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, 16 through 19, the things that God hates. Yeah. And it's the things that people are doing every day. Mm. But, you know, when we get focused on these other things, we start saying, well, you know, at least I'm not an abortion. Yeah. At least I'm not this. But you forget about that you are, you know, you're sowing discord among the brothers, that you are, you got a line song, that you, you know. That's so, so good. You know, I think it's a danger. And, you know, uh, I know some of my congregation will start talking about certain things and they'll say, well, you know, I'm all right, you know. Mm. I'm not. I'm not like him. I'm not like that. Like you said, right. like that That's brother. Right. You know? That's right. But you, you know, you may be worse than that brother. <laughs> That's right. But but ask your Lord. <laughs> yeah. No. I was speaking about degrees. I wasn't. Say, I was uh, speaking of it in in the context of your lesson. Mm. You were talking about Christ-centered preaching and then getting to the application. Uh huh. Amen. If I get Amen. the explanation wrong, Amen. I'm going to end up applying it wrong. Amen. So therefore, when I was speaking about the degrees, I wasn't talking about saying, well, to make me feel like I'm better or, you know, but uh, but there is just simply uh, the fact that you don't uh, punish people. Disobedience or law breaking, the punishment is in, ought to be uh, comparable to what was done wrong. So you don't punish somebody, uh, you know, now we know with God, any sin, uh, you know, it, all sin is sin, but, uh, but, but not quite to the Yeah. That, so that's the point I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about in, in living life. If I, you know, if I'm if I'm involved in homosexuality, right? There is a greater uh, there is a greater possibility that in life, and that's why I think the brother there was speaking about that. There is a greater chance of me ending up with some uh, some physical. Issues that I won't get 
See, I don't know that that's true. Hey, I don't know that that's true. Right? No, so there's... there's medically, it's been proven that, uh, you know, that there's a lot of uh, diseases related to sexual, uh, to homosexual. Uh, so, that's been scientifically proven. So let me, let me do this in the, in the interest of uh, maybe time and um, keeping us on, on the scripture. <laughs> um, so I, I think what I hear in your comments, brother, is that I'd want to make a distinction between human justice and divine justice. Correct. Right? Correct. So when we're talking about doling out human justice, which we're called to do, we need to take into account a sense of proportionality, proportion to the, to the injustice. I absolutely agree with you on that. We need to take into account um, things like the, the sort of nature of the victim. So if, if, if the victim is a child or a person with disabilities, we, we tend to see a crime against that person as more heinous than two grown men you know, duking it out you know, in the street, et cetera. So there are a number of factors in there that should be taken into account at arriving at something that looks like justice, right? Um, and, and, and it would be, as I think you're saying, an injustice to give, um, to use a real life example, someone caught with simple possession of recreational marijuana, the same crime that you would give someone who has been trafficking marijuana and cocaine and other things in huge volume. Right? So to sort of so so give them the same sentence, even though they weren't doing the same thing, would itself be an injustice in, in, in the sense of human justice. Now, what I would not wish to do, um, and, and I don't, I'm not saying that you're doing this, I just want to be, be clear because we then keep coming back to moral issues in this conversation about judgment. I, I would not then want to argue from the sort of human examples back over to divine justice and what would be just in a divine sense. Partly because, as David says, though he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, he says, ultimately, my sin is against you and you alone, Lord. Well, that is to commit a sin against an infinite God, an infinitely good God, right? And that's part of the basis upon which, whether it's still in a candy bar or murdering a hundred people, we die unrepentant of that sin and unbelief. In one sense, we all get the same judgment. We're all separated from God eternally to endure his wrath. Now, whether or not we want to talk about it's better for Bethsaida and Chorazin than it is for you, right? That's a good conversation to have. My point is just, it's all bad. It's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a conversation that we want to have in the place of, again, I know you're not saying this. Um, it's not a conversation that we want to have in the place of pastorally when I'm preaching, what am I calling people to do? I'm not calling them to make those kinds of distinctions. I'm calling them to see themselves in the presence of a holy God who will deal with them about their sin and that they therefore need to respond to his grace in Jesus Christ, right? Um, the pulpit needs to make a certain sound. The trumpet needs to be clear, right? And unless the text is telling me to get into these sort of categories to explain Bethsaida and Chorazin or explain, you know, sins done in the body and et cetera, et cetera, unless the text calls for that, I'm probably not getting into that kind of categorization. That's all. Uh, with, um, you know, this, maybe this is just my own thinking. Of course, of course it is. <laughs> it ain't Pastor Jack's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Destroyed 
it says something pretty, pretty strong that God would destroy a whole city of people because of their homosexuality. And I know there are those who try to. Uh, but but hold on, but hold on. I, see, this is where I, I want the scripture to speak because I'm going to go back to my brother's citation in the New Testament. That's not how Jesus uses that text. He says, if he's saying anything strong, he's saying it's worse for you than Sodom and Gomorrah. No, I'm not, I'm no, 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 no. Stay with me. Because I, I think you're going in the opposite direction with that comment. When Jesus appropriates Sodom and Gomorrah and, and uses it as an object lesson for his hearers, he's basically saying you guys are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Correct. So the stronger statement isn't Jesus destroyed a city because of homosexuality. That is strong. No, I wasn't talking about Jesus' statement. I was talking no, no, about but, just but, the reality. But I'm bringing, I, I understand, but I'm bringing it back to Jesus' statement because we're talking about Christ-centered preaching, mm -hmm. and we're talking about how Jesus reads the Old Testament right. and how Jesus uses it there. This is a good example of how we could draw a moral conclusion without going through Jesus and actually reach, I think, a right conclusion but, a, but an incomplete conclusion. So yes, it's right to say it was terrible. It was, a, it was a, an awesome demonstration of God's wrath and holiness and the heinousness of their sin that he destroyed that city in an instant. That's true. Correct. But that ain't all the text is telling us. If we stop there, brothers and sisters, that's what I'm talking about in terms of a kind of moralism that's not Christ-centered preaching. We want to come over to Christ first. See how Christ dealt with that text and then drop it down into our lives. So it's true, but it's partial. It's part of the truth, right? And I think if we are in the pulpit ringing those partial truths, ringing the bell of those partial truths without coming through Christ and then coming down to, to letting Christ define how we understand those things, that's how we're going to be sort of off the line. That's how we're going to lose the plot there. Um, and so this is a hard conversation because in some ways it sounds like we're disagreeing about how bad Sodom and Gomorrah. We're not. We're, I'm, I'm in complete I'm agreement saying, saying, about that. I'm saying it's a terrible sin. That's right. But I'm saying and don't stop there. And, I, and I'm not saying that there's any sin that we should embrace. I, agreed. I know you're not. I'm simply saying homosexuality in every way must be condemned from the pulpit in Christ-centered preaching. See, and, and I'm saying every sin must be condemned from the pulpit in Christ in a preaching. And the singling out of homosexuality is the, in, in, is the indication. It's more prevalent. I, don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know it's more prevalent than lying. I don't know it's more prevalent than disobeying your parents. I don't know it's more prevalent than any of the other sins that are mentioned there, brother. It gets more press. And, and, and honestly, and, and it creates a greater visceral reaction in us because we, we I think most people have a reaction that Paul has in Romans chapter 1 when he says it's to abandon the natural use of the woman or the natural use of the man. There's something unnatural to it that we feel. But, but, I, but I let, let me finish. Let me get... A lying movement. I don't know anybody trying to start uh, a stealing movement. These people still admit those things are wrong. One of the major problems that I see with the sin of homosexuality that now they're trying to convince you that it's actually so are people trying to convince you that leaving your first wife to marry your third wife or to swing with several wives? I just can't defend it in any way. As a but, but you can't, you can't defend adultery. I don't. Right, 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 right. So I'm saying, stop singling out homosexuality. Oh, you need, to, you need to get out more, brother. You need to get out more. Come to D.C. Come, come spend some time with me, brother. No, I mean, we got whole movies. I just watched on... Um, the clip of, what's that, that um, podcast, The Pivot? Anybody know The Pivot? It's um, former football players, basketball players, um, Barber, I forget the name of them, uh, Crowder. They had Kevin Hart on the show. Yeah, they have, all kinds, they have all kinds of people on there. You see what on Kevin Hart? So this brother starts asking Kevin Hart what he think about going to nudist colonies. And swing, because he said, I like to go there with my wife, and like the da 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 And even Kevin Hart was like, 
what's happening right now, man? What y'all talking about? <laughs> right? Like, you know, you know, he's like, I'm not being pumped. Is this, you know, and somebody about to jump out behind the curtain and say, we got you, you know, and the man keeps talking about this and they begin to talk about swinging all that kind of stuff. Brother, I, it doesn't appear to you that these things are happening because you may be clicked, and all of us are, have limited things we can be clicked into. So you're clicked into another set of things, but the fact that you don't see it don't mean it ain't happening. It's, it's as common as YouTube, right, and, and, and professional athletes talking about swinging, talking about adulterous stuff, trying to justify it, right, to the point where even somebody as crude as Kevin Hart He's like, man, you don't need to be doing that, man. You know, you know, even Kevin Hart. So all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, I want to I move us along. My brother got a comment, and uh, we, we, we're approaching lunch, and I work for food. So <laughs> all, I'm saying, all I'm saying here is, brother, I, I just, I want to discourage us, precisely because of what Pastor Jack said a moment ago, thinking about Proverbs 6. I, I want to discourage us from allowing what might be our own personal sense of. I'm not homophobic. I'm not saying you're homophobic, brother. I'm not saying that at all. I agree with you about the issue. So this is what I'm saying. It, it feels like we're disagreeing, in, and I don't want anybody to be mistaken that we're disagreeing about the issue. We're not, right? What I think we're disagreeing about is the place of priority that we might put one moral issue against another. And I just want to discourage us as men who declare the whole counsel of God, who believe that God speaks in this book. And our job is not to preach ourselves, including our opinion about these things and their relative weight compared to other things, but to preach what thus saith the Lord and to represent Jesus to his people. I just want to encourage us to work really hard not to let these sort of personal things slip out as if they are God's perspective. It's easy for us as people who are right about the morality of an issue, it's easy for us not to stop and think about whether or not I am right in all the ways that God wants me to be right. Right? So that's all I'm saying. It is, let's let the scripture set the agenda for the pulpit, right? And, and let's let the scripture set the, the balance and the weight to these things. And then let's declare with all of our might what thus saith the Lord, right? And, and let's let Jesus determine that. Amen? Amen. Well, we should stop here. Pastor, you want me to pray or? He's like, he's like, I don't know. I was checking on lunch. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're doing, bro. So it's 12, it's what, about 12, 15, 12, 20? Okay, so lunch is ready. All right. Well, let me offer a word of prayer. This is a good conversation. I don't mind the pushback, and as you can tell, I don't mind pushing back. So this is iron, this is iron sharpening iron, and this is what Keelan and I do every time we get together. We have fun like this. So um, don't go away thinking that there's anything but love between, between us in this way. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his work on our behalf, how he has redeemed us from a much-deserved judgment and how he has made us, Lord, your children, uh, though we don't deserve it. And we thank you that you have left us your word. You've protected your word through the centuries that we might have it even in our own language and we might have freedom in this country to give ourselves to it completely. We pray that you give us grace to do just that. We pray for our brothers and sisters in lands where they would be persecuted for this truth. We pray, Lord, uh, strengthen them and hold them up and reward them greatly and bring, Lord, their persecutors to their knees in faith in Christ. Uh, we pray now as we go to, to break bread, having fed from your word, we pray that you would feed us um, with this physical bread, that you would give us health and strength, uh, that you would knit our hearts together in love as we fellowship, Lord, over this meal, and that um, we would grow by it, Lord, spiritually and physically. Uh, thank you for the hands that prepared it. Thank you, Lord, for the church and its hospitality. Reward them a hundredfold, Lord, for their goodness and kindness to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. All right. Hold it. Hold it. Don't go nowhere. Just sit right there. <laughs> All right. Hey, <laughs> 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 Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my brother.